in first century Jerusalem, you would see a group of disciples or students walking through the streets and among them leading the way their teacher, their rabbi. So valuable was the opportunity to follow the rabbi that you longed to be covered in the dust of his feet. Jesus of Nazareth was walking those ancient streets. Today, Jesus is still calling disciples. Come, follow me, that all who draw near may be covered in dust. I love the ending of that song, how it sounds kind of like a lullaby. It's like falling asleep for Jesus. <laughs> but now it's time to wake up, church. Now, here's the deal. Uh, just a quick question for you guys. How many of you noticed as time goes on and things become more progressively technological, as we enter further and further into the information age, uh, that like at this very same time, there is this kind of uh, increased interest in ancient things, in like uh, primitive ways and stuff like that. Uh, here's what I mean. <clears throat> Uh, a number of years ago, there was uh, like this diet that kind of became popular called the caveman diet. Uh, some of you guys are evidently fans, like, yes, the caveman diet uh, that we would eat in a prehistoric way, so to speak. And so people are eating like bone broth and like raw kale and crazy things like that. And uh, ultimately, you like kind of study your genetic ancestry, figure out what they were eating. And, and if you align with that, there's some like nutritional value to that for your body. But this isn't just physical things. This also includes spiritual things, right? I was listening to a scientific podcast a number of years ago when they were noting uh, how prayer has all of these cerebral advantages for your mind. Like you physiologically uh, in your prefrontal cortex develop through things like prayer. And so you have totally secular, not religious people saying here in the West, well, we need to pray somehow. Like there is no God, uh, but like... Like, maybe we'll, we'll do this, like, you know, quote-unquote mindfulness thing, or we'll practice meditation or concentration, but we want the benefits of prayer, seeing that there's value in these older things. Um, my personal favorite is, like, reading about these tech CEOs and uh, how they are creating all these innovative technology through their companies and all of this, making tons of money from it, but they won't even let their kids use any technology. Have you guys seen this? And they're, like, having their kids, like, study the classic literature that's out there, Greco-Roman history and all kinds of crazy stuff like that. And it's a height of hypocrisy. But what's going on is that it seems like as modern people, the more that we learn, the more we actually discover that we are way behind our ancestors. That like primitive, pr uh, primal, kind of ancient, historic practices often had it right in the first place. And so today, what I want to talk about is an ancient practice like that, the practice of Sabbath, the practice of Sabbath. Um, this is an old idea, but I think it is a better idea for our lives. And we've been talking about practicing the way of Jesus, growing in likeness and nearness to Jesus through disciplines, spiritual disciplines. And this one, I think, is very crucial as we talk about rest. And so uh, to that end, we're going to talk about the Sabbath as a rhythm of rest. Uh, this is actually important to know right from the get-go. And some of you uh, who are experienced Christians, so to speak, may well know this, that uh, as followers of Jesus, we are not under the law, and therefore we do not need to practice the ceremonial rituals of the law. And so because of that, like, there is a certain degree of that ceremony of the Sabbath that we are no longer bound to. However, the moral principle of taking a rhythmic rest, perhaps one day a week, it still carries on in Jesus. And so we need to embrace this as a rule of life, as something not obligated, but invited by Jesus. And so um, when we talk about spiritual disciplines, I'm going to use the phrase means of grace. Means of grace, because we are accessing some of the grace that God has to offer us in sanctification through things like Sabbath. And so, here's what I want to do. Uh, if you're taking notes, or if that's your personality, this will be helpful to you. But I want to talk about three functions of the Sabbath in our life. Like, if you embrace a rhythm of rest, like, what are the three functions of that day of rest in your life? And the advantages there, uh, spiritually and how it shapes us. So, uh, here is the first one. 
Number one, uh, this idea of a rhythm of rest is institutionalized grace. It is institutionalized grace for us. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 8 through 11. The author writes, For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Uh, what the author of Hebrews is doing here, and really beginning in chapter 3, is using the idea of the Sabbath rest. This rest that God took on the seventh day in the creation narrative. And he is saying, spiritually speaking, Jesus has become that long-awaited, desired spiritual rest for our souls. And so in Jesus, in the gospel, the good news that he lived for our, uh, uh, righteously, perfectly, died for our sin, and rose again so that we might have new life in him, and, and he's returning and all this, of the gospel, uh, that reality is also entering into a new kind of rest. And so he says we need to strive to enter into that kind of rest that even the prophets long awaited. And so it's this massive kind of mega theme in scripture that we need to enter, spiritually speaking, Christ's rest. It's part of the gospel. And so how does that pertain to actually practicing rest in taking a Sabbath day? Well, here's how it pertains to it. That like sometimes we believe some things very theologically, <laughs> Doctrinally, we can articulate some things that we, you know, as Christians, we believe X, Y, and Z, but practically we betray it through our actions. And so here's what I want you to think about. If I were to take your phone right now and open up two different apps, I could, using those two different apps, discover uh, what is meaningful to you. Um, if, if the first one is, if I were to take your uh, Google Calendar, right, uh, open up your Google Calendar, uh, I would find out what you value. Now, if you're using the Apple Calendar, I would find out that you don't actually value yourself, okay, uh, because it doesn't work. Like, is it, does anybody use this thing? Like, it's, it's kind of garbage. But but if you look at the Google Calendar and the way that uh, it works, like I would see that you value work, right? Because you have all these work meetings and it's meaningful to you to chase after what you're trying to build. Um, I could see that you value your relationship with your son because you have his soccer games on there and all this fun stuff for his birthday and everything. Um, I could do the same thing on your banking app. Find out what's truly meaningful to you. But if on that app, and both of them, you said, like, there, there was nothing on there about my wife, then I would say, man, it could be true that you and your wife sincerely love one another, that you guys have a relationship of love, but it's not being practically embraced at the level that it could be. Your relationship is suffering because you don't have her integrated. There's no gifts on that app. There's no, uh, you know, time spent together. Like you're missing out on the joy of what you already have in her, bro. Like that's what we're saying. And so when we're talking about institutionalized grace, we're saying, hey, one day a week, God invites us to integrate him to access his grace, to as a means of grace, as a spiritual discipline, stop and say, Lord, I value you. And I'm going to embrace living my life as you, uh, as you demonstrate in the Genesis account and onward. Um, so here's kind of the, the breakdown. I want to give you three things that make this institutionalized grace uh, actually the way it works in our lives. And here's the first one. It's institutionalized grace means that it teaches us the gospel that it teaches us the gospel. Uh, at Rise City Church, our vision as a, as a church is to rise up and to saturate our city with the gospel. gospel. Shh, don't say it out loud. Rise up and saturate the city with the gospel. Good job, good job. Uh, that is our mission statement. That's what Jesus sent us to do in Matthew 28. Go take the world, make disciples, and preach the gospel. Uh, and so this is the big idea. We cannot be effective at our mission statement unless we believe the gospel with our lives first. And so when we look at this, um, we need to say, yes, I am a gospel person, but I also live like it. I actually embrace this gospel rhythm 
rhythm in my life. The gospel, as a principle, if you're new to Christianity, I want to I describe this to you. The gospel differs from religion. Religion says that I have to do in order to be. That my works and my accomplishments spiritually, they actually result in who I am. The gospel is quite the opposite. The gospel says we are not defined by what we have achieved, but by what Christ has achieved for us on the cross. That we are not accepted because of what we have done or what we will ever do, but we are accepted by the pure grace of Jesus who died for us. That's what the gospel says. And so there is no effort with which you can earn the gospel or earn God's favor. There's no effort. There's no work involved in obtaining the gospel. There is only a receiving of God's grace. And that is really good news. Like you can take a sigh of relief internally. But when we overwork ourselves, we are saying, even though spiritually I conceptually believe this, my identity functionally is in my accomplishments. We're not rehearsing the gospel. Um, And so in the gospel, let me remind you how this works. Uh, Some of us fail to think about the eternality of the love we've experienced in the gospel. Um, Track with me here, but like the gospel actually means that we are beforehand loved. We are beforehand loved. Uh, You think about Psalms. And in Psalm 139, you have the psalmist, and he is talking about how he was in his mother's womb at one time, right? And that it was God there who knitted him together in his mother's womb. And he, he was there knitting you. And it was God who was knowing him and loving him. And he had all his days in like a book, so to speak, laid out before him. And he knew every one of them. And that God loved you before you had done anything good or bad. Then you jump over to Romans chapter 9. And if you are in Christ, this is what it says about you. That essentially God, before you were born, before you even had a chance to earn anything, that solely on the grace of God alone, not saved by, man, he looked forward into the future and thought, man, man, they're going to choose me at this point in time. No, no, before you had the chance to not choose him, he chose you. And that in, in, in eternity past, he goes, he goes, I'm not just going to choose them. I'm going to set my affections on them. I'm going to love them. Sure, they have done nothing, but man, I am the one who is good, not them. That's who God is. He is the one. In the gospel, it is all about grace. At the end of Romans 9, actually, if you kind of follow the logic, uh, Paul, the apostle, says, some of you will say, that is really unfair. Like God is just like choosing people and he's just like loving them in advance. And that seems really unfair. And Paul's response, because he's Paul, is basically like, exactly, of course it's unfair. And how dare you question God? You know, like how can the pot say to the potter, like, how have you made me thus? And so he like challenges, like, of course the gospel's unfair. That's what grace is. We are a people of grace. And so naturally it follows that we would establish rhythms of institutionalized grace where we receive his love. Furthermore, it keeps us from being crushed under our burdens. Um, Institutionalizing grace through the Sabbath actually keeps us from being crushed. Um, In my devotional time, like personally, like reading through the Bible and all that, I've been reading 1 Kings. And uh, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, all of that originally was one book. But as I'm studying this, I actually uh, forget about certain of the personalities in the story of Scripture. Um, Do any of you more Christian people like familiar with the name Elijah? Elijah. All right. So how many of you heard a sermon on the prophet Elijah? This guy is gnarly and I think very preachable, okay? So here's who he is. He essentially goes to war with the false prophets of Baal in his day. And uh, the way they're going to do it is they have altars there. And they have sacrifices on the altar where you burn the animal unto your gods. And so the Baal worshipers, 450 of these false prophets who are, by the way, doing wicked things that I'm not going to get into right now. They're very evil people. They, they, They show up and they're on Mount Carmel and it's a it's a showdown. They say, hey, look, you, light, you ask your gods to light this uh, sacrifice unto your gods. Like, just ask them to bring fire from heaven. And so they do. They ask indeed. And basically, uh, they're, they're asking the gods, and they are going at it. They're just like dancing and like spinning on their heads. They're cutting themselves and doing crazy things and chanting, and oh, gods, come down, come down. And I love the prophet Elijah because he's over there just like, okay, guys, yeah, yell a little louder. You know, like he's just taunting them like, yeah, I just love how like, like just honestly rude the, the prophet is. He's like, maybe your God can't hear you. He's like, you 
know what? Your God's probably in the bathroom, you guys. Like, he's sitting on his throne, you know? Like, just shout some more. Just go crazy, why don't you? And then uh, they, they get exhausted. They give up. And then the prophet Elijah has his turn. And rather than, like, going crazy and doing all these seances and stuff, he says, hey, you know what? Let's, make, let's up the ante a little bit. He says, let's, it's been a drought for three years. Take all the water you have. Pour it on this altar. Let's make it impossible. He's like, actually, pour more water. Actually, let's dig a trench. Let's put a moat around this bad boy. Let's make it that if this miracle happens, it's only by God's power. And then what happens is he says real softly, like, Lord, you just imagine he's calm. It's like, these people, they need to see you. Like, show up in power and glorify yourself. And God consumes with fire every element of that altar not just the sacrifice not just the offering the altar itself the water all of it is evaporated all of it is consumed and they're like off with these false prophets heads and they win the battle (laughs) i'm like (laughs) like man can we do this on a sunday you know like (laughs) all two altars we'll get the some other people (laughs) you take this in a really weird direction but then the part of elijah's life that isn't preached as often is actually in chapter 19 the very next and this is what i want to focus on so he sees this miracle i mean he is at the height of wow i've seen god show up and i've done all this with him and his power And what we see next is that Ahab the king and Jezebel, who had raised up these evil prophets, they're like, you may have won this battle, but you have not won the war. And they said, hey, your life is going to end. We're going to take you out. And Elijah, you could just feel it. It's like Elijah had done all of this, and it amounted to nothing. Israel isn't seeing revival. The whole thing, it's not repentant. And what he does next is really telling. In verse 4 of chapter 19, it says this. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. Are you even pausing right there? I'm not a doctor. I'm not a psychologist. but And maybe some of you are. But like this is like clinical depression at this point. This is a dark place. For this amazing man of God, this amazing prophet. But I need you to see how God responds to this. And he lay down and he slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. This is fascinating. You almost expect God to show up and say, hey, here, here's what we're going to do. Like, like you got to get up, Elisha. Like, you saw me move. You're going to see me move again. And like, give him some kind of like prophet motivational speech and be like, come on, repent, dude. Like, we got to get, let's go. Like, we're, there's work to do. Like, you can't bail out on me. I know you're tired, but we've got this and you're filled with the spirit and let's, let's go. Like, God doesn't do any of that. What does he do? He sends an angel, his messenger. And the angel shows up there. And he lets Elijah sleep. Elijah's asleep, taking a nap. And he wakes him up and he says, arise and eat. And he's got like a charcuterie board ready for the prophet. (laughs) Charles Spurgeon on his commentary in this says, hey, look, do you think it's unspiritual of me to say that you need to chase after things like rest? He's like, it's unspiritual of you to not be chasing after your rest. Because for God, he saw that this physical need mattered too. The God who created the heavens, the God who, who thought of matter in his mind said, hey, like you, you actually need your, your needs, your basic needs met. And so I'm going to feed you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to allow for you to rest. Man, I saw some guy like last week or something like that and walk in with a shirt that said, Jesus took naps. So be like Jesus. And I was like, I don't know if that is the proper exegetical, like, interpretation of that, but, like, I'm for the application a lot. God's there just taking this man and giving him 
rest. This is why it's institutionalized grace. Because God knew there would be people like us fighting through thorns and thistles. Men and women like you and me who grind ourselves and our families into the ground, waging war on the brokenness of this age and the reality of the brokenness of our work. But here's the problem. If we don't attend to the rest God invites us to at the rhythm that he um, did in the creation, is that um, it doesn't matter. And we, we chase after work and we think, man, I got to build. It does not matter how much you accomplish, how much money you make, or how much house you can buy working and working and working if you do not have time to enjoy it. If you do, if you do not have friendships, if your body succumbs to overwork, if your soul weathers and you become a miserable person to be around, please don't nudge your spouse right now, right? Like if, if, you're, if you're overwhelmed, if your marriage fails, and if you don't know your kids, bro, like we have to be people who stop and say, God is first in my life and I believe the gospel and I am willing to rest in him. And kind of the last thing on this institutionalized grace is this idea that uh, when we practice this means of grace, it is delighting in and enjoying the life God has allowed us to build. It's delighting in the life that God is building and he has allowed us to participate in in building. Genesis 1, what we find is that uh, there is this um, pattern. Uh, Day 1, God said, and he saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And that pattern continues the second day, the third day, the fourth day, fifth, sixth, and then you get to the seventh day, and it does not say that. It says that God rested. And what's beautiful there is the pattern actually stops, and that day, it doesn't say about the seventh day, um, there was evening and there was morning. You ever notice that? Why is that? Well, it's because the implication uh, commentators throughout history have noted is that that day was an everlasting day of rest, where we were in the garden with God, and that was the permanent state of joy. Another interesting thing about this is there are two words there in Hebrew used to talk about how God rested. It says that he first, he um, ceased from his work, and that word is the Hebrew word kala. And then it says after that, and God rested. And the word for rested is not kala, but sabbat or Sabbath. And so there's actually a difference between simply ceasing from work and Sabbathing. If we are to practice this pattern, we actually have to have a moment. Um, The idea is that he kind of rested in the work. He rested and experienced what he had made. And you see this pattern prior. When In the other six days, what is he doing at the end of it? God saw that it was good. God has this way of stepping back and admiring what he has accomplished. He has this way of stepping back and actually enjoying it. And this is what's fascinating. We think about God being creator and and you, you talk all about that. But like what's fascinating is the poetic nature of God's personality. Like when he creates, he had every opportunity to just make reality as we know it in a way that simply bears out function. But he doesn't. He also makes it with beautiful form. When you consider, uh, I don't know if you've like done the thing where you're like, man, if we ever go to Europe, this is where we're going. You guys ever do that? Is that just us? We're like, oh, dreaming. And, and you look at the beautiful images of the Alps that God's voice spoke into existence. And you look at those things. Or you, you drive down US 26 for that matter and you see Mount Hood. Um, and half of us are bored of it. But like when you first see that, you see it and you're like, you're struck by it as the light like beams through the gaps and bounces off the snow. And why are we so drawn into this kind of breathtaking beauty of these mountains laden with snow? Well, it's because God has a poetic heart. He wanted to create things beautifully. He wanted to make things worth enjoying. That is his nature. That is what he's done. Or you consider the universe. Like when you look up at the stars this summer, if you go camping or, or, or anything like that, and you gaze at the wonder of it, you, you think God could have just created the earth. There was certainly a way for the mind of God to say, hey, like I'm just going to create a planet and they're going to be able to survive there and we'll like contain it somehow. Like certainly God could have done that. Why did he make the expanse of the universe? 
Like, why would he make it so huge? Why, if, there, if, if this is the container in which we need to live, would he go to all that effort? Would he make the majesty of the systems therein? Why would he make the nebulae so beautiful when they explode and expand and do all of these things? Here is why. Because God wants us to step back and admire his glory. That's it. Like, he wants us to say, God made this, and God is glorious, and look as we delight in him. Look as we delight in the beauty of it. Look as we rest. And so, I don't know if you guys do this, but this is what Sabbat looks like. When you stop and you just say, Lord, you are so good. Lord, look at what you've allowed me to build. Lord, look at this precious family. Can I just stop and enjoy it? I want to give you guys some like really practical ideas on this, um, just kind of on this point that like when you talk about Sabbath, what does it look like? Because the ceremonial law is done away with. So how do we Sabbath in Jesus? Here's a few ideas. Number one, sleep more. (laughs) Come on. (laughs) Let's close in prayer, right? Like if you were like me, like I don't sleep at all, basically, right? Like, and on the Sabbath, it's like, hey, find a way to do it. Like, oh, you know, like, we have little kids. I get that, dude. I get three myself, and I get that. But like, hey, like, find a way that, you know, you guys can trade off or do something. Like, sleep more. Take a nap. Play with your kids. Like, play with your kids. Get on the ground. Remember what it was like to be a kid play with them and just don't like just do it as a, a thing. I don't know, dad's in the room if you like get off work and I'm like, I feel like I'm, I'm supposed to be a good dad. So like, here we go with Legos again. And you're like stepping on them and then you're like breaking commandments because you stepped on a Lego <laughs> and like, but like, like get down and like, enjoy it. Like, man, like build it. And like, like, it's just you building Legos. Okay. Um, and enjoy it with them. Be in it. Read for fun. Uh, I am a big reader, and I spend a lot of time reading, like, uh, all kinds of, I don't know, um, nonfiction things, if I can categorize it. And my wife just reads novels. And I'm like, I don't remember the last time I read a novel for the novel's sake. Get Lord of the Rings. Like, spend time enjoying that kind of stuff. Um, Do something active. Some of you are like, reading sounds like not Sabbath. And so maybe you need to go take a hike. Maybe you need to go play, uh, you know, work out at the gym, whatever. And lastly, and most importantly, seek the Lord. Like, spend time with him. This is the joy of our lives, to know God. And so seek him, which kind of brings me to the second idea here is, um, number two, it's not just institutionalized grace, but it's also training in trust when we Sabbath. Training in trust. Here is the big idea. God is sovereign. Look, play along with me. Everyone say sovereignty. This is a doctrine, and it is a good doctrine. The idea is that um, God oversees and superintends every atom of this universe. That there are no maverick molecules. (laughs) That God's extensive reign is so thorough that there is nothing that is outside of his absolute dominion and control. God is sovereign. That's the idea. It's a kingly term, and it means he rules and reigns. I love what Charles Spurgeon says. He says this, Every particle of dust that dances in the sunbeam does not move an atom more or less than God wishes. That every particle of spray that issues forth as Nolan is preaching... and dashes against the steamboat, has its orbit, as well as the sun in the heavens, that the chaff from the hand of the winnower is steered as the stars in their course. Listen, if God is sovereign, then you and I can trust that he will work in our non-working. That when you go to bed at night, God will keep the world spinning. That when you have no control, God is still in control. And by taking this day and saying, no, it is yours, we are leaning into the sovereignty of God practically. Um, I'll just share with you guys uh, where Lindsay, Jade, and my wife and I are really jacked up. Uh, You guys want to know where we're messed up? Um, We have this, (laughs) who said that? (laughs) The prayer team is back there. (laughs) Um, Here's the deal. So for... For, for us, uh, we, we both, um, we have this like 
like actual rule in our family that there are, there are no surprises allowed. And the reason for that is because early on we were like buying each other gifts or surprising each other with things. We'd be like, oh yeah, thanks. Like you should really text me the next time you're at the store because I like to have control over everything in my life, <laughs> including what you gift to me. Like this is 80% good. Like, can we figure this out? I'm like, oh, like you want to do that? Like kind of me too. And like our control freak nature is just enabled by each other. And so like everything is on the table. We know like, and if one of us even attempts to kind of slightly surprise the other, we're like looking for it on Amazon because we need to be sovereign. That's what I'm saying. Like this is who we are. Even recently, uh, my wife said, hey, like I need you to take this day because for the first time in like 11 years, I'm going to try to surprise you. And I was like, ah, it's, just tell me what it is. Like let's, <laughs> let's work this out together. We need to know, like, I, I don't want to, like, miss out, and, like, so we just make sure. And then she goes, like, no, it would bless, you know, bless me if you would allow me to bless you. Come on. And I'm like, okay, Christian trump card, like, with the Jesus <laughs> thing. And I'm like, yeah. So I'm like, okay, go for it. And so I gave my wife my sovereign permission to, like, surprise me. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm still, like, every day trying to, like, ask her questions to catch her off guard. So what are we doing in a couple weeks? You know, like anything new in your mind? Like just seeing what I can poke at. And you know, I wake up this morning, I'm literally like, I have been thinking about this obsessively to the point that I think I might have an ulcer a little bit. <laughs> and I go to her, I said, I'm being good. Like, I trust you. It's going to be awesome, you know? And uh, she's like, okay, good. She's like, you know you can trust me. I can guarantee, I know you so well, you will like it. And I'm like, I'm sure I will, you know? And she goes, Nolan, I spent money to make sure that you will like this. And I go, you spent our money? <laughs> This is the control freak thing, okay? Like you just want to have your hands on it, value freedom, and it's like my choice. But here's the deal. There is a difference between giving intellectual assent to the sovereignty of God doctrinally and embracing it in our lives practically. And if you are a control freak, let me just say this in love from a fellow sinner, you need to repent. <laughs> Like we actually need, and maybe this becomes a phrase that you use, but we need to practice the sovereignty of God. Not that you would practice having sovereignty, but living in light of his. That, we, that when you're going through a hard time, when you're, when you're tempted not to rest, when you're tempted to pick up the phone on the day, that you would practice this and say, like, I'm going to practice the sovereignty of God today. I'm going to trust in his sovereignty. No one spoke more beautifully about the sovereignty of God than Jesus. In Luke 12, 27, it says this. This is Jesus speaking. Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? Do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. I said I was reading uh, 1 Kings a ton for my devotionals. And so, like, I know all about Solomon now, right? This is Solomon. And Solomon had wealth, yo. Like, Solomon had it. He had money. Uh, I, I mean, there's this point. So he makes a palace of gold, and he's like, he has all these, uh, these workers, and he has all these women, and he has all the wallet you could ever desire. Like, he is, he's, he's, He's wealthy. <laughs> like, Solomon's got it. There's one point where he, he doesn't just plant gardens. The dude plants forests, you guys. And not only did he plant these forests, he, they had to dig out rivers to water the enormous forests that he planted. This is Solomon. Solomon had money. Solomon had the finest clothes. Solomon was iced out. It was dripping completely. <laughs> This is Solomon. Make a celebrity. Just Bieber's got nothing on him. Jesus goes, you know all the splendor of Solomon's wardrobe? Look at those lilies out there in the field. <clears throat> See those lilies? Solomon was never arrayed like one of those. God dressed those. And if God dresses those lilies out in the field, here today and they're gone tomorrow, how much more 
is God going to take care of you? How much more is he going to meet your needs and be there and oversee and superintend the needs of your lives, even in your suffering? Like his purposes for you are good and you can trust his sovereign hand. Lastly, it's, it's these three things, right? Institutional grace, that it's a rhythm of grace in our lives. Uh, number two, that it trains us in trust to practice the sovereignty of God. But number three, it is a foretaste of the future. It's a foretaste of the future. The Sabbath during the week is a picture of a larger rest that is coming. Hebrews 4.9 tells us, so then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. And one day a week, when we anticipate all that God is going to accomplish upon his return, one day a week, we are remembering and telling of the larger story. As we sit in our backyards with friends, as we hang out at a coffee shop and just take deep breaths and enjoy, as we, like, whatever it is that you do on a Sabbath rhythm of rest, we're remembering that ultimate rest is coming. And you guys, we need to remember this. As a matter of fact, um, this week and the last couple of weeks, there's just been tragedy after tragedy after heartache after heartache at this church. I mean, weren't we here even last week praying for the Reeds, whose dad has a, a brain tumor right now? And by the way, be praying for them. Like we laid hands and we prayed because this fallen world is broken. And there is disease and there is heartache. And there, yesterday, Jason was here preaching the gospel to some 400 people who just lost a loved one. Like in this building, hardly anyone from Rise, in our lost world, people are seeing the heartache and the pain and you feel it too. It is why we enter this rest to remember that one day we're not gonna experience this stuff anymore. I want you to see this in Revelation 21, three and five. It says, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man and he will dwell with them and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Church, we need to remember that. We need to remind ourselves that one day there will be no more weeping. That one day there will be no more sin, no more temptation, no more darkness, no more burdens to bear, no more physical pain, no more anxiety, no more depression, no more fear late at night for what will happen to your kids. No more divorce. No more fighting. No more anger. No more waking up sick. No more stories of abuse. No more shootings in our newsfeed. All of this will be done away one day in Jesus Christ upon his return. And as we, as we enter into this rest, we remember that that day is coming. And we tell the story that all of this is going to come to an end. And instead, we will stand in the presence of the one who created us. And he himself, like just imagine this, Jesus, the good, the powerful, the sovereign, the gentle Jesus, will literally wipe your tears away. Like what will that be, why, be like? And he will welcome us into everlasting life and joy and healing and love. And there's one day a week that points to that. And by participating in that day, we are allowing ourselves to somehow like drag that future hope and that future reality into the present today. And we need that. Guys, we need to step into this. We need to embrace the rest that we are offered by Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I ask that we would take hold of your easy yoke today. 
that we would let you place your light burden upon us. And Lord, as we um, seek to rest in you theologically, in our minds, and our hearts, which matters, may we also take literal steps, like physical steps, towards Sabbath, towards stopping, towards delighting, towards enjoying you. Lord, I want to pray for those who are right now going through pain, heartache. They're feeling overworked. They're actually dealing with some pretty heavy stuff. I pray that today we would even step into something of your Sabbath right now as we worship, that you would do deep heart work in us, God. And I want to pray that all of us would find practical ways to obey you week in and week out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.